So my name is Aaron Jones, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I work at the Chandler Police Department, but I'm not representing the Chandler Police Department tonight. Um, I am a software developer. I have a master's in intelligence analysis, and in addition to that, I have a focus in cybersecurity. So let's go ahead and start with our social media safety, just like we'd be given the officers. At the conclusion of this course, you'll be able to identify at least one safety concern with social media. Generally, this is relevant to law enforcement, but it is also relevant to the public. We're going to learn what settings to manage to enhance social media security and why some of these settings don't matter as much as you think they do. And then we're going to describe one event relevant to social media that has affected law enforcement. Now, some of you have already seen this, but after I gave this presentation last time to the public, a gentleman who used to work at Google came to me and told me that this was a really, really good talk, but if, he, if I'd like, he wanted to tell me some stories that I could use for later, and he told me about some additional stuff in here that uh, sort of expounds on some things that we didn't know about until he actually told me about it. In addition to that, there is some bad language in this one, so if that offends you, I apologize. So right about now is when I would ask anybody who cares to participate, if you have Facebook on your phone, if you don't mind, would you raise your hand? Yeah, a couple of people, Facebook, okay. So let's go ahead and start off with Mark Zuckerberg. And this is a chat that he had with uh, one of the people that he knew at school. I'm just gonna read it to you. Yeah, so if you ever need any info about anyone at Harvard, just ask. I have over 4,000 emails, pictures, addresses, and SNS. The redacted friend, asked what, how'd you manage that one? And he said, people just submitted it, I don't know why, they trust me, dumb fucks. Now, of note with this conversation is he did come forward during an interview and he said, I don't think I should be judged by this because now I know better than to make fun of my customers. And it was a very rude thing to say about these people who use Facebook. But of note, he did not mention that, well, the tool itself is pretty toxic and their methods pretty toxic, and uh, still using his product is still a bad idea. So he didn't put any of that in there, but he was very apologetic about whoever he offended, uh, just for the words that he said. So Mark Zuckerberg himself, believing that users of Facebook are quote unquote dumb fucks, has made that belief well known. He's told people about that before. and. As it is right now, many people are willing to part with very personal information without thought of the consequences. Now, for anybody who wishes to do more uh, investigation of that conversation and some of the other conversations he's had, uh, you can go to Esquire right there. And that link, once you follow that, will take you to some of his other conversations. And you can follow the rabbit hole at your leisure. So let's start off by talking about these social media companies for a second, just to get a better idea of how they function globally. So I give you here the 10 top sites that we know of, okay? With a user base of approximately 1.60 billion accounts, we have Facebook. That's the reigning champion right there. It's a lot of accounts, right? And then we have WhatsApp, which again is another Facebook product. And then finally we hit Tencent QQ, which is a Chinese slash international group. And of course we also have WeChat and QZone, both Chinese. And then we have Tumblr, Instagram, Twitter, Google+, and Baidu Tiba. If you notice something here, you have a majority American companies and then Chinese. They're split kind of evenly. Now, for those of you who don't know, in China, it's illegal for you as a, a citizen or, or anybody in China to use Facebook. And the purpose being that they block Facebook over there because they considered a intelligence tool for the American military. So if you're funneling all your information into Facebook over there in China, then you're harming the country. You're harming China's security. So they have made it illegal, which is why you see this two, fact, uh, two groups of software. You can either go with the American side or you can go with the Chinese side, but the Chinese really doesn't want anybody using any of the American products. Now, of course, Facebook can be accessed over Tor, they have hidden services, they have all of this stuff to allow people from China to funnel all their information and pictures and data and everything that we can get out of China into our systems over here. So keep that in mind. Now, for every single one of the companies on here, the product is you. 
you're the product. You, you provide them information, you provide them uh, pictures, you provide them geolocation data, you provide them recorded conversations from your cell phones. You provide a whole lot of information that provides them with a whole lot of money. And in addition to that, you go out and buy things because they are able to advertise to you through these tools. Now, most people would know that you can opt out of a lot of this stuff following Prism Break. Now, I'm going to open this here, but I would like to say that not all of the tools found on this web page here should be considered secure. Now, for those of you who missed it, we had a multi-part course where we talked about I2P, we talked about Tor, and we talked about Freenet. And I have a pretty low opinion of Tor, not a big fan. I2P I'm okay with, and I'm a big fan of Freenet. Uh, and if you go through and you start looking at some of this stuff, you'll see that they discuss getting yourself hooked up to Tor, using a lot of these products that uh, I don't 100% agree with. And so what I usually tell folks, especially since my audience is generally cops and law enforcement, is if you have questions about this stuff or you're thinking about installing one of these applications, bring it to us to review it, take a look at it, talk to you about it, and tell you about some of the things that you're going to still face security-wise. And then if you want to still install that stuff, go right ahead or not. Now, again, just to reiterate, if you're going to start moving away from these tools, you need to be very, very cautious in what you decide to start installing and start working with, or you're just going to open yourself up to a completely different avenue of attack as opposed to whatever it is that you're trying to get away from. Do your homework, but also understand that the data that you're sharing is extremely valuable to people who want to cause you harm as well. Uh, everybody here familiar with 4chan? A little bit? Some people? Sure. So I'm going to head on over here to my presentations. And I'm going to open up my operational security course. And I'm going to open a couple of images here that we're going to work our way through. And I have a whole bunch of them. And most of them come from places like 8chan and 4chan and places like that. But the first one is on, is on an Israeli raid that was canceled after a Facebook leak. Uh, if you follow these, the links are a little slow to load. I use archive.is uh, to archive all this stuff. Loads kind of slow. But eventually, it'll come up. And if it doesn't come up, just keep hitting refresh, and eventually, it will come up. So Israel was planning to do a raid. Somebody, as a part of that raid, decided to start posting pictures and selfies and telling everybody about what they were going to go do on Twitter and how much their ass they were going to go kick and all the people they were going to shoot and so on and so forth. And they ended up having to cancel the raid. Um, it is a loose lips, sink ships kind of situation. Now, this is kind of a glaring example that most people would look at and go, hmm, that's probably a bad idea. If I'm going to go do something clandestine, I probably shouldn't be posting about it online. You don't want to tell people about it. You don't want to be using your cell phone with your GPS coordinates turned on. Is everybody familiar with one of the major situations that just happened recently with the people who were using Fitbit? A whole bunch of military folks decided to add the Fitbit apps to their wrists and so on and so forth. And then they were doing laps around their black sites. And it made a perfect map of exactly where all the CIA and NSA and so on and so forth agents were operating overseas. Because you could go to Fitbit and you would see these guys running tracks out in the middle of the desert where there's not supposed to be anybody. Just right out in the middle of Afghanistan, you have a perfect map of the outline of their bases. Okay, Something to keep in mind. Whatever these tools are that you're using, if you have GPS turned on, if you have any of this other stuff turned on, it's going somewhere. It's not going to just stay with you. Uh, the US military ended up having to investigate secret Facebook groups recently. Uh, a whole bunch of Marines were having um, sexual relations with other Marines, taking pictures of these young ladies, and then trading and swapping the photos. 
And they had hundreds and hundreds of photos that they were trading on Facebook and so on and so forth, taking pictures and passing them around. Uh, huge em embarrassment for the military. Uh, a lot of these guys are in trouble or getting in trouble or having uh, the book thrown at them as we speak right now. Uh, now was not really the choice time to be engaging in this behavior and it is also not exactly appropriate for them, but uh, I guess they're learning. And then our buddies at the Islamic State, they decided to go around and start finding U.S. military accounts with poor security and start breaking into them and using them uh, to post jihadi messages about what they were doing. Uh, in addition to that, uh, these groups have operated by looking for open social media accounts, making friends with people's kids, uh, connecting with different people around the world and then gathering that information because the idea was we're going to find these folks, we're going to get as much information as we can about them and then eventually we're going to execute an attack. And so they have looked for people's families, they've looked for their kids, they've looked for people who are active duty military and they've looked for specific hashtags and such so that if you're doing something like posting thin blue line stuff if you're in law enforcement or you're posting yellow ribbon campaign stuff if you're in the military, well, they're looking for that so that they can make friends with those folks and eventually cause them harm. And of course, when you use passwords like one, two, three, let me in, and you're not using two-factor authentication and so on and so forth, of course, they end up breaking into this stuff. Now, Just FYI, generally, I follow a gentleman who talks about Syria. Is everybody familiar with the fact that right now Syria is in the middle of a huge war? Some, some folks know about the Syrian civil war, maybe a little bit. Okay, so we're going to talk about it for a few seconds because it's good to have a ground for what we're about to go into so you have a better idea. And if you didn't know, I'm fairly certain that right there up in the corner should be, uh, I believe, a Syrian flag. So. In Syria right now, there's a huge civil war. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the Vietnam War, the Vietnam War was kind of the first war where we had actual news cameras go out with soldiers and film stuff, and you would actually be able to see the battlefield. They said the Vietnam War was the first battlefield that we ever brought into our homes because you could sit down and you could watch these guys standing in the jungle shooting rifles. You could see them eating food. You would see the helicopters flying overhead. We had actual news following along with these fights. Uh, today, the war fighters overseas have fan clubs. Okay, So you have people like Givy. You have people like Motorola. Uh, Motorola not being the company, but Motorola being the war fighter who is currently dead. Uh, he was killed in an attack, but uh, he was a Russian soldier who worked radios earned the call sign Motorola while he was in the Russian military and then went into Syria and started fighting. And you have young ladies who were snipers like Snow White, she's also dead. Uh, I believe every single person I'm going to speak to you about right now have all died. Um, Givy was blown up by a RPG rocket that was filled with gasoline. So he was actually burned to death uh, after it struck. It's a Russian munition that hit the building, exploded, filled it up with gas, and then detonated and ignited. Um, but just me being able to tell you these things kind of shows you that the war has gotten to the point where you can literally sit there and watch and find out what's going on within minutes. And in addition to that, if you want to be able to watch these people operate while they wear their GoPros and they fight and you want to see the actual war happening in near real time, you can do that now. And again, like I said, they all have fan clubs. So Ivan Sidorenko, he died in an IED blast last year um, during a patrol. This gentleman right here, he gets on Twitter and he says, does anyone know where this place is on Wikimapia? And a whole bunch of people on 4chan took a look at this picture, found the video, and this video was, uh, what, it, what it broke down to was a whole bunch of uh, Islamic terrorists decided to behead people and do the marching and the running and, 
demonstrating who they were and the saber rattling and so on and so forth in this video while playing their nasheeds, the music over the top. And he took a few pictures, screenshots, and then put it out on the internet. So somebody on 4chan said, hey, let's help Ivan take these people out. So from there, they start looking for names because there was names within the video. They were showing information. And of course, one of the problems with these battlefields is that the city names, they change. The, um, the location names, if you're a, a Russian, you're going to call a place a completely different word than if you're in the Islamic State. Each one of these groups, even though they're all fighting in the exact same city, will have different words. So they start looking through this stuff. And then they start using Google Maps, all open source tools. The exact same tools that you would have available to you if you were to sit down at your computer right now, this is what they're using to track these folks down. Taking pictures, placing the pictures up against images from the maps, zooming in, and as you can see, they find the minarets. And they're able to say, okay, if I'm standing right here, then for the camera to have been right here and to see these minarets, this must be where I'm located. And they start building themselves sets of latitudes and longitudes. And as they build up these latitudes and longitudes, they start talking to the guy. And eventually, as you can see, hey, I already replied to Ivan, and I hope he calls in a, an airstrike. And guess what? He did. He went in there, and they sent jets over the place, and they killed a whole bunch of people out there. And everybody celebrated. Hey, we've got blood on our hands. We finally did it. Uh, you know, they get in there, let everybody know, hey, what a time to be alive. Can't believe it. And he goes in there, and he says, hey, Shout out to Pole and SG, because those were the folks that made this happen. So it went from a tweet, a tweet from a, an, a combatant overseas asking for help to a whole bunch of people sitting around in their underwear with anime avatars doing intelligence analysis work on photos and videos, and then providing information that ended in a whole bunch of people getting blown up. And of course, they had to throw one of those in at the end. So, you might think, well, maybe that's a one-off. So, they decided to do it again. And at this point, they go in and find another rebel training video, and Sidorenko sends them a little information, and they start tracking all the stuff down and getting information on the items in the background. So, as you can see within the videos, right there in the background, they can see these towers that are used for the power lines. And so they start doing the math on how big these power lines are. For it to be this much of the power line in the picture, they must be this far away, doing all of the math on this stuff. And they start figuring out, well, we're pretty sure this must be it. Here's the transmission towers. There's a dug up semicircle. Is this that driving area where they're operating out here shooting rifles and running around and being silly? And then you can see they go here, one, two, three, for the towers. And then, of course, on Google Maps, they go ahead and map it out. One, two, three, there's the towers. And they start breaking this all down. And, of course, everybody's getting real excited. You know, this might be it. We might have figured it out. We might know where this place is, so on and so forth. And eventually see they get down there and they reach out to Ivan and they let him know hey this is where the bad guys are and so they go out there and they bomb the place and they blow those guys up too so when I'm explaining to these officers what's happening here is even though in general when you have one of these cybersecurity courses usually somebody will get up and tell you what turn off GPS coordinates on your photos right Make sure that you don't have anything like your um, uh, data from your, your EXIF data from your camera connected to your photos, so on and so forth. They give you this small amount of information to kind of inform you that these are things that you should be doing to keep yourself safe. But in reality, a 
generally normal, regular person sitting at home has all of the tools available to them and probably only lacks time or maybe just a little bit of desire to take whatever information that you're putting up online and start using that to gather information about you for whatever purpose they might have. Now, here, you're probably not in going to live in fear right now of a Russian colonel calling in an airstrike on your home because you posted something stupid on Facebook. We're just, that's not us. We don't have to worry about that right now. Okay? But we do need to worry about somebody deciding that they're going to sit down and use the information that you're posting to track down your home, track down your family, and cause you harm or cause your family harm. And with the way things that are going right now, it is entirely possible for somebody to go and look at this and decide that they're going to kidnap your daughter and stab her. Because why? Because it's happened overseas. We've seen it in France. Uh, in France, they had two police officers who went home and a gentleman broke into the home. And this was before France was allowing the police officers to take their firearms home. So this gentleman breaks into the home, kills both the husband as well as the wife, and then takes their toddler and gets himself up on the Twitter live stream and films himself with the knife and the child asking Twitter to vote on how he should kill the little kid. Well, before he's able to do that, enough people show up and they end up breaking into the home and they, uh, they eliminate the threat. However, the fact of the matter is that that is not outside, the realm, outside of the realm of possibility for that to happen here. Because we, again, we've seen it overseas, and if it can hope it happen overseas, it can definitely happen here. Now, as you remember, at the very beginning of this talk, I asked if anybody had phone applications for things like Facebook. Now, the reason why I asked this, and for some of you, this may not be applicable, but again, this is the exact same training that I give our officers that I'm giving to you all. Many of these tools record your conversations. Facebook. They record your conversations. When asked about it, what do you record? They said, we're not going to tell you. That is proprietary information. However, rest assured that we are not advertising to you. So I hope that that, in some way, makes you feel good. Because it doesn't make me feel good. Uh, Google does admit that the recording that they do of your devices is for advertising. Um, some of these places claim that the information that is pulled from these recordings is in some way either hashed or encrypted and is not available to employees there. Now, I disagree with this and having spoken to somebody who actually worked there, I have been vindicated in being told, no, it's, it's available for people and they are able to read it. Uh, the way it was explained to me was, one of the big perks of working at a place like Facebook when you sit down is they come to you and they tell you uh, if you like to stalk people or read all their emails or you want to know what they're doing with their life, this is a great job because we get to do all that stuff. It's awesome. We know everything about everybody. And that was sort of the selling point of if you come work for us, you get to do all this stuff. So let's talk about David Barksdale for a minute. That's a great segue into this gentleman. Uh, circa 2010, David Barksdale, working at Google, uh, has a proclivity for young girls between the ages of 14 and maybe 16. That's sort of his, his upper limit on how old he likes his women. Uh, and he starts sending them messages, finds girls to talk to them, sends them messages, starts reading their emails, going through all of their communications, uh, locating their boyfriends and then locating their boyfriend's accounts and then pulling phone numbers and threatening to make phone calls and asking these young ladies for all sorts of stuff. Now this went on for a while until one of the parents was finally able to get a hold of somebody and get it shut down. And Well at this point it goes up into the news. And David Barksdale is brought up and they say, well, nothing he did was sexual. It was never sexual. So we fired him and, th and it it's okay. But the amount of data that he had on these young ladies and the amount of information that he had demonstrates 
that they had access to what amounts to everything, and he was able to see all of it. Now, they said that they have increased logging and can pay better attention to what's going on. Okay, we, we might buy that. Now, I was told that David Barksdale did not make his interest in young girls in any way a secret, and that he went to a party that was held uh, at a some snow resort, some kind of ski resort, and at that ski resort, there was free drinks provided. He decided to get himself real lit, and after doing so, he then went out onto the slopes looking for 14 to 16, maybe 17-year-old girls, and then came back and very loudly talked about how hot they were and how he was chasing them and so on and so forth and all the things he was going to do with them. And they didn't eliminate his position at the time because he was useful and he was worthwhile to have. Okay. Now, the only reason why he got fired was because he got caught, which is very important. When do you all think the last person to get caught and fired for abusing their access to confidential information from any of these social media places was? Anybody got a guess? Nothing? No guesses? How about maybe two weeks ago? How about that soon? Facebook? Uh, is everybody familiar with Tinder? The, the application Tinder? So Tinder, for those of you who aren't shaking your head, guess what? Now you just earned yourself an explanation. Uh, Tinder is an application where you get to swipe to decide whether or not you like a person. Okay? And then it allows you to, to communicate and usually has you connect through Facebook. So gentleman gets on there, starts swiping on young ladies, finds one of these young ladies, gets into a conversation with her and tells her, I know everything about you, gives her all of her information from her Facebook, tells her about everybody that he knows from her account, goes through all of her data, and essentially tells her that he's some sort of counterterrorism super spy who hunts bad people, but in addition to that, he also chases women using his Tinder account so that he can like find out everything about them. It sounded like he had a real bad case of the super soldier, where he's probably not ever been involved in anything, but because of his access to data, now he's super special forces, and he goes by codename God, and he's a sniper, and so on and so forth. Uh, once he decided to do that, his big mistake was the young lady that he was trying to impress by telling her that he was an ultra stalker was also happened to be a reporter. And so she let him keep talking and run his mouth and say all the things that he was saying, and she recorded it all. And then she took it straight to the news and went and posted it everywhere and said, Facebook engineers have access to all your data and it's super creepy and also this guy is stalking me and he's admitted to it. So they yank him up and they fire him and they said, well, not everybody has access to this stuff. Maybe just a few people do, but in reality that's not true. Essentially anybody who works there has access to a whole bunch of this information and they are abusing it actively. How soon? Well, as late as two weeks ago. We know that for a fact because they had to get rid of one of them. Now, the reason why this is important is because many of our officers have to sit down and walk into a room and sit down with somebody who is between the ages of 13, 14, 16 years old who is going to sit there and talk about terrible, terrible things that have happened to them, okay? Abuses that they have suffered and things they have gone through. And if you have that phone sitting on the desk recording that conversation, potentially somebody like Mr. Barksdale is going to be on the other end re-victimizing your victim because he's going to use that information for himself. Uh, so at this point is when I would urge you, if you're ever in a situation in which you're going to be around or with people who are going to be doing an investigation or uh, potentially an uh, interview with a victim or so on and so forth, take your phone and leave it at your desk. Leave it with somebody else, but don't take it into the room with said victim and offer to that person, hey, if you have the opportunity, hey, can, do, do you mind if we take your cell phone and we just take it out of the room while we talk? Because you don't know what's on their phone either. And if not, then they want to keep the phone, then that's fine, but that's what I would start with there. 
Now let's talk about some of these data aggregation sites and people search. Is everybody here familiar with these? Yeah? You go to it and you type in a name or you, maybe you type in an address or a phone number or whatever partial information you have and it builds sort of a, a web of information about a whole bunch of people so that you have access to uh, if you have maybe a child's name you put in the child's name and then you can find the parents, the brothers, the sisters, grandma, grandpa, you find out all the addresses they've ever lived at, whatever cars they've owned, so on and so forth. If you did not know, this is very, very powerful information. Now the first thing most people will tell you is to go to these things, put in your own name, and then down at the bottom hit that button that says report and say, I don't want you to have my information, blah, 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 this is me, here's the links, get rid of this stuff. Now the reason why I warn you against this is because that moves you from the maybe pile to the yes, we for sure have this person pile, okay? You will never get rid of this stuff. At this point in time, until they change laws, they are going to post information about everyone, and it is all up here, okay? There is tons of information available about tons and tons of people. Now, uh, here in Chandler, we have the Chandler's Most Wanted, two individuals, Asim Hart, he's still, they're still looking for him but then he also had a uh, accomplice, and they were involved in a murder out here, if you don't know. Uh, they went in to do a sort of a knockover. They were gonna pretend to buy drugs, but instead of buying the drugs, they were just gonna rob the place. Uh, they decided to execute a young gentleman who had nothing to do with anything. He was just sitting around on the couch playing video games, and uh, so they killed him because he was there, and there was no drugs, and there was no money. They made a mistake. And so they murdered this guy and then took off. Uh, one of the gentlemen, long story short, they both get away and they break up, go in opposite directions. Let's, let's put it that way. One of those gentlemen, nobody can find him. So I got on the people search and the people finder and the true people search and all these other tools. And I started building a map. Now, if you don't know how most people operate, what are things that we need? Food, water, shelter, and especially you need shelter because you need to be able to hide from the cops. There are people actively looking for you, right? You're being hunted. And at that point, it becomes even more important that you don't have interactions with law enforcement. You don't have interactions with border patrol. You have to be very careful where you head so that you don't end up in a situation where somebody checks your ID, right? So this gentleman takes off and I pull all the information and the first thing that I realize is well, everybody that he knows has some sort of connection to Brooklyn. Brooklyn, New York. All of his connections. Every single person has an address or a previous address in Brooklyn, New York. That's sort of the name that just keeps coming back up is Brooklyn. So then I look and I find out that shortly after he disappears, a whole bunch of family members move back to Brooklyn. So that's weird, kind of suspicious. So looking further, I start pulling those addresses and I find out that one of the addresses turns out to also happen to be uh, what I thought at the time was government housing. I was under the impression that it was, but it was not. Uh, it was actually housing provided to people who work for a certain union. And if you work for that group, then you get access to housing as part of your benefits for living out there. But I didn't know this. I was under the impression it was government housing. So looking at all of these things and who was living there and what kind of area they were in, they had essentially created a small nest. And the only reason why you would create a small nest is if you're hiding people there, if you're needing to support somebody. You need multiple people, you need multiple people to be able to work to support one person in a place so expensive who can't work, can't get a job, and has to be very careful where they operate. So I took that information, I handed it over, and I said, I am fairly certain that this person is located here. And they said, yeah, us too. Surprise, surprise, that's where we think they are too. And lo and behold, a few weeks later, that individual finally crawls out from under a rock and goes to buy some weed, and it turns out to be an undercover cop from New York. And upon doing so, he gets yanked up. And now he is one of the duo who is currently in custody, and we're just waiting to pick up the other one. So these tools especially if you have an analytical mindset and you're familiar with the way some of this stuff operates, is very, very powerful, very useful. 
It's useful for, useful for investigations. It's useful for studying people's movements. It's useful for being able to pull and draw data about a ton of stuff. Now, of course, social media in general makes it easy to build connections with people. You can share your photos with friends, stories with family members, or catch up and communicate with people you haven't seen in years. That's fantastic. It's great. Now, the problem is that it's also a powerful tool and it can be used by law enforcement to catch bad guys or by the bad guys to track law enforcement, military, so on and so forth, and their family and friends. Okay? Regardless of what side of the fence you're on, this is, for all intents and purposes, a weapon. There are many methods and tools available that make it simple to follow accounts from disparate sites, locate victims, and to build databases that can reveal extremely private information. Um, for somebody like me, I can use it for all sorts of stuff. Uh, I used social media back in the day for my job. Uh, I had access to tons and tons of stuff, and it wasn't unheard of to pull accounts on people that were this thick. Hey, I, I have a person. I need their social media information. Please send it to me, and I would get a packet this big. Some of that stuff has changed post-Snowden. Now that Snowden's done, things have they have actually changed. There are, there are differences in how a lot of this stuff operates if you're not familiar or you don't know. So going back to our questions up here, let's review these one more time, and then we're going to talk about Mark Hamill, not the Jedi, somebody else. Okay? We're going to identify one safety concern with social media, right? We're going to learn what settings to manage to enhance social media security, and we're going to describe one event relevant to social media that has affected law enforcement. So going all the way back down here, well, <clears throat> one of the main concerns is social media is an intelligence gathering playground that can be used to perform reconnaissance on a target. Easy, right? If you have social media or you have any of these tools, it is very simple to take that data and aggregate it and eventually turn it into actionable intelligence that can lead to A, getting blown up by a bunch of Russians, or B, being tracked down because you are a criminal, or C, having some guy track your family, find out where you're located, kill the husband and the wife, and then sit there on Twitter while deciding what to do with a child, just like what happened in France. Do not allow targeted ads. Provide GPS coordinates for yourself or overshare, and this is the most important one. Having the GPS coordinates, having uh, targeted ads, any of this stuff is not nearly as bad as the amount of oversharing that happens with data. So. Normally, I have a bunch of guys who have their arms crossed, and they're huge and muscly, and they're SWAT guys, and they've got rifles and pistols, and they're the toughest dudes you'll ever meet, and they're super strong, and so on and so forth. And I have to remind them, you're not the target. Nobody's going to look at you and say, yeah, you know what? It would be really awesome if I got my ass kicked today. That's what I want to do. Because that's not what they're going to do. They're going to look at that guy, and they're going to go, OK, that dude could probably beat me up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check his social media and I'm going to find his 13-year-old daughter who's doing the hashtag thin blue line and so on and so forth on her Twitter and then I'm going to go for that because that's a soft target and I'm not going to get my ass kicked. And that is the most important thing for those people and it's the most important thing for anybody else sitting there to realize is that oftentimes you're right, you're not the target, but the people around you may potentially be. So also keep in mind, people can read your messages, and they may not be friendly. Every single one of the bad shoots, even the ones that were considered by law good shoots that have occurred on the East Coast, every single one of those law enforcement departments were broken into within hours. Not days, not weeks, hours of the news reporting on an individual dying. Immediately, people were in their records. They were in their data, they were in their evidence, and they were in all of the information relevant to the police officers, like their home addresses. They were pulling information on spouses. They pulled a ton of information on every single one of those law enforcement groups. So that is another thing to keep in mind. The minute something happens or occurs, or you end up in the news, potentially somebody is going to go after you. Now, example, Michael Hamill, was known as the hot cop, sexiest cop alive, so on and so forth. 
Uh, now, he was fired for anti-Semitic comments he made as a youth. Now, when you go into law enforcement in general, somebody will sit down and they will take a look at your social media. And a lot of people get real offended by that. Oh, you don't need to, excuse me, see my social media. Why do you need to see this stuff? It's private. The reason they need to be able to see this stuff is to find out if you're doing stupid things online. Because guess what? People are doing stupid things online, believe it or not. So Hamill here decides as a kid to jump on his Facebook and just post oven jokes, anti-Semitic jokes. Uh, he posts all kinds of stupid stuff and his whole social media is just full of that stuff. But nobody ever noticed or looked. So then he gets his beard trimmed real nice, he's got his full outfit done, he's got his uniform on and he deploys to a hurricane in Florida. And while he's out there, uh, he ends up in a few photos helping people where apparently he looks very well dressed, very trim, uh, handsome. Handsome's the word, right? And so people put it all over social media, all over the place. He's the hottest cop in the world. They start calling his department, asking him to come and arrest them so that they can be put in cuffs by the hottest cop in the world. It's silly, and he starts reveling in it. He eats it up, gets on Twitter, starts posting, communicating with people, so on and so forth. Well, it took one person to actually go in and start looking at his background and seeing all of his old posts and so on and so forth and the next thing you know he's lost his job and his entire department is a laughing stock and in addition to that there's an investigation that's launched because they went through his social media and found out that he was a super scumbag and doing stupid stuff <coughs> excuse me so there is a reason why they asked to look at your social media to check these things and so on and so forth so all of your social media linked devices, including phones, and I'm super excited about this. I don't know if anybody's noticed, but uh, for anybody who has an Apple phone, your, if you open your settings, you'll see that no longer Facebook, Facebook is no longer in there as a, a default app that's married to the operating system. Apparently they have now removed that. So that's a fantastic first step in getting that out there. Now they're now treating Facebook, Twitter, so on and so forth as separate applications from the way that they had um, sort of just welded it in to iOS. And that started with iOS 11. Uh, but going back to this, including phones, tablets, vehicles, and otherwise, they're each pushing your data up to advertisers and others who may or may not have your best interest at heart. Case in point, Amazon Alexa. Anybody here have an Amazon Alexa? No? This really isn't the crowd. In some of my other talks, <laughs> you know, I, I do this talk and I, and I say, who has an Amazon Alexa? And I see half the room go, me, I've got one. And then I talk about this part and everybody goes, oh, shit, i got to sell my Amazon Alexa. So Amazon Alexa, there was one in a home. There was a murder within the home. Amazon Alexa recorded the murder. So officers requested, hey, we, we want the recording of this murder, we want to be able to hear it. You need to give us this information. Uh, my understanding is right now they're in court, not because Amazon says they don't have the conversation, but because they don't want to give it up. Okay, so what does that tell us? Good chance that they have the capability to record and keep data about what's going on in a home long enough for there to have been a murder for however long till that murder was found out about, and then for it now to go into a court case and for them to start pursuing that information, okay? It's a pretty long amount of time for them to have what amounts to plain voice. Facebook, they take over your microphone. Google, they take over your microphone and they can listen to your home and your private conversations. Games and tools will often contain components designed to mine other applications in your phone. This is where I also have to explain to you if it says, can I see your contacts, can I get access to your microphone, or uh, can I look through your camera and your photos so that you can play Candy Crush, not something that you want to really give that access for, okay? It's generally not worth it for you to give up complete control over your device in exchange for some kind of Skinner box. <coughs> Just keep it in mind as you're using your phone, okay?
Now you have little control over what is done with your data or where it goes. And it's obvious that they don't want you to know what is being done with your data. It is obvious that they would rather keep that, that mystique of, well, we're here to protect you, we're here to watch your stuff, we're here to keep an eye on it, so on and so forth. We know better than you do, and we need this information so that we can sell to you. Uh, be cognizant in everything that you do in the presence of your device, because you could be potentially be mined for information. Okay. Now, my final recommendations here are, in a perfect world, don't use social media. Monitor your friends and family for inappropriate use of social media, especially kids. If you have children, if you have grandkids, um, occasionally go in and do some searches. Everybody in this room is probably more than smart enough to, to look at these people's searches and so on and so forth. At least get an idea of what your threat footprint is. Uh, in the military, you would hear it used as like war games. You would hear terms like war games. You sit down, you figure out potentially where can you be attacked, who can attack you, what kind of enemy that you might face, what kind of force that they're going to bring to bear. You can do the exact same thing. You can look at what your social media footprint and so on and so forth is, and then use that information to think to yourself, okay, if I was a bad guy, is there enough data here for me to execute an attack? Oh, my kid over here is posting pictures of him at the ball game. Well, pull that picture down and see, oh, he's posting GPS coordinates with timestamps. So they know that he is always on Wednesdays at baseball, and this is the exact location he's at every single time. You can do these exact same things and figure this stuff out for yourself. And then do not interact casually with people you do not know, because guess what? People lie on the internet. They will pretend to be somebody else, and you can run into that. And they will pretend to be a 12-year-old child and make friends with your 13-year-old child, and they are not a 12-year-old child. <coughs> and it feels like, for many of us who grew up when the internet was first coming out, I was taught to never post pictures of myself online. But for most of the, the children who have been bored post-Facebook, that advice is no longer given. People do not understand that you shouldn't meet somebody at Walmart because it's not going to make you a viral star. Well, it might, but not in the way that you want to be. So I'm going to close that one down, and then we're going to move on to Tails. Does anybody have any questions or anything? Uh, yes. So you said that we should not put in our name to the people searches and then report that it should, that that is us, right? Don't report. Well. So again, if you report, because you can, and you can go in there and you can say, hey, this is my information, I'm confirming that it's real, and here's, sometimes they'll ask for a copy of your driver's license, and then they ask, okay, well, with all of this information, now I'm going to take this off. But the thing is, is that many of these um, companies, and I'm gonna use the term incestuous, they're very, very closely linked, and they operate in a such a way that maybe that company that you just contacted is going to take that off, but they're immediately going to report to all the subsidies, subsidiaries, and they're going to say, okay, this data is real. Here's a picture of the driver's license. Here's everything we need. This person is the person that we have, and all your data is just going to show up on another web page. And it's like playing whack-a-mole. Does that make more sense? Right. So then what, what should we do to get ourselves off that? You can't. That's the problem. And I don't think that that's going to be able to be done until we start looking at laws in relation to how this stuff is used. And I don't think that they're going to look at the laws until a judge or uh, somebody major, like a politician, gets popped by one of these things, and then they're going to look at it. I think that's the only point that, that we will see something like that actually become a problem. Because for many of us, we look at it and we go, oh, this is bad but you, you can't do anything about it. They get your records from public records. Yes. This has already happened to judges in Texas. They, there were judges who, through social media, were stalked and killed and um, didn't really. Well, there you go. So then, would it be better to opt out or would it be better to not? Because then at least people who are using these are not able to like search for, say, an address as easily. I, it, it, no, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that it would be even 
remotely difficult. You're not even setting up roadblocks. I mean, it's nothing because you have so many. I, I gave you three web pages, but if you go online, you can find it, tens of hundreds of them easily. And the ones that I gave you may not even be the ones that you find just because of your search profile. When you actually sit down and Google tries to feed you stuff that you're going to see, you're going to find completely different companies anyways. So, no. It, I, I don't even know if it matters. Yes. So when Facebook got busted for all their stuff and Mark Zuckerberg was up on Capitol Hill, uh -huh. a couple of days after that, they came out and they said that, oh no, we made tools for you so you can download your data for your Facebook and Instagram. But I don't remember hearing them saying, you know what, we're going to delete your data when you do that. Right, no, they don't. And that's because most of it is actually contained. Is everybody here familiar with the term LexisNexis? Yes? Okay, so now, since you want to talk about this, then we'll talk about it. So Facebook has a direct connection to LexisNexis. If you don't know what LexisNexis is, LexisNexis is a database with all of your data. They call it the shadow profile. Now, if you're wondering, how detailed is the LexisNexis shadow profile? Well, it's detailed enough that certain financial companies will use that in lieu of an actual credit report because it's more accurate. Uh, law enforcement uses LexisNexis all day. I had a LexisNexis account. It was awesome. Back pre-Snowden, LexisNexis combined with some of the other accessible tools that we had, fantastic for getting information. So they're not going to delete your data because that data has been placed into a, a database that's being used by law enforcement, by intelligence agencies, by everybody. Everybody has access to it. And again, it's called the, the shadow profile. And the thing is hyper, hyper accurate. Way better than credit reports, way better than anything. Yeah, but that's the thing, like, the, the normal person, the person that's not a tech kind of person. Mm -hmm. they, they immediately assume, well, I can download my data, now they're going to delete it. <laughs> so, and they're not. Exactly. Yeah, and they're absolutely Every not. single news story I saw said the same thing. Yeah. And uh, uh, mind you, when you look at these companies, Again, let's remember, these, these news companies, they work with Facebook. They advertise amongst each other. They're all interconnected. You know, the one company washes somebody else's back, and that company washes somebody else's back, and so on and so forth. And they all take care of each other. And when Mark Zuckerberg got up there and he was like, yeah, I have a lot of data, and they gave it to me. And these people said, well, what are you going to do with it? And he was like, I don't know, we'll make it available to people. Here, you can look at it. But nobody really cared. And they didn't make any actionable changes. And they didn't pull anything down to say, hey, you need to delete this stuff. Because they're not going to. Uh, let's, now we're getting sort of into the, the, the future of, like we're future casting here. No, no, I understand. But we are future casting here. Sesame Credit, China. Let's look at China. Sesame Credit is China's social media that they are designing specifically for deciding what you do with your life. And you can look up Sesame Credit, and what it consists of is social media accounts that are designed to allow you to report somebody. So let's say that I'm sitting here, and this gentleman right here in the front posts something on social media, and he says something like, not really happy with the party today. The Communist Party is doing the wrong thing. Well, I can raise my status and gain credit points by reporting him to the party. So I go on the social media, and I hit report, and I get points for reporting him. Now, if my child is playing video games too much, and Sesame Credit finds out that my kid plays video games too much, I lose points because I'm being a poor parent. And they, they are using this all over China, and they are developing this process to allow them to decide what happens. So if you have a poor Sesame Credit score, you will not be allowed to have a public facing job like a um, tour guide. Because potentially as a tour guide, if you're showing a weakness and a, uh, a, a possibility that you're going to betray the party, then we don't need you touring around with Americans. So this Sesame Credit system, with them building this as a method of being able to track people, and it's it's in use right now. It has not been deployed countrywide. But the way that they're deploying this thing is they're taking uh, groups like uh, the, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but it's the Ugars. The Ugars, 
they're the, the, they're the local Muslim population for China. They're taking these groups and they're putting them into re-education camps. And then because it's very difficult to take these groups and give them IDs, they're using this as an alternative IT system. So they can ID you, take pictures of you, add you to this account, and then they can give you and take away points. And that decides whether or not you can get jobs, whether or not you can go for education, whether or not your children can get an education, and what jobs your children can have, and so on and so forth. And you get points for reporting people for poor behavior or anti-communist action. And the whole thing, again, it's called Sesame Credit. You can look it up. We've talked about it previously. It's in some of my other videos. But that, that method of public control over what it is that you're doing is what I feel the future of using these tools will be like for here. So is there some kind of repercussion if somebody falsifies like information? You know, I've never seen that discussed and I'm not sure. So I don't know because I've never even seen that brought up in any of their discussions. Everything that I've read about it has been colored in a very positive light, where to us it sounds very dystopic, right? Like, I hear this and I think, that's, that's 1984 style, that's the worst thing I could possibly think of in terms of, here's an opportunity for you to put the real numbers right on their arm, and you don't even have to put them in a fence, because their fence is digital now. They'll, they don't know that they're grazing in the field. But the entire Sesame Credit system is what they would like to eventually implement here. And they've talked about it. So if you're interested in that topic and you'd like to see what's happening in China, I definitely recommend that you read it. But again, you're going to see it in rose-tinted glasses because they're only going to give you positive information about it. Anything else? No? Okay, cool. <laughs>